Hi, this is Herb Kressel, and welcome to the October uh, Radiology uh, Podcasts. Uh, this month, we have three uh, discussions for you. First, I'll be speaking with Drs. Rijang Lee and Daniel Rubin from Stanford, who uh, wrote a, a very provocative piece on early stage non small cell lung cancer, quantitative imaging characteristics of FDG PET CT predict distant metastases. Lots of interest these days on biomarkers that can be used for uh, prognosis, and I think our readers will find the discussion quite stimulating. Next, my colleague uh, uh, Dave Kalmes, deputy editor for Neuroradiology, will be speaking with uh, Dr. Eyal Lotan, who with his colleagues at the Tel HaShomer Hospital in Israel, uh, reported on the diagnostic value of apparent diffusion coefficient for the accurate assessment and differentiation of postoperative intracranial abscesses. This is an unusual application of diffusion imaging, and we think you'll find uh, this uh, discussion of interest. And then finally, I'll be speaking with uh, Dr. Matthew McGinnis uh, of the University of Ottawa, who uh, has an interest in uh, meta-analyses and uh, with his colleagues there uh, published a paper in our journal, Diagnostic Accuracy Meta-Analyses in Imaging Journals, an analysis of pooling techniques and their impact on summary estimates of diagnostic accuracy. The short form is that not all meta-analyses of diagnostic accuracy are the same and depending on how you analyze them, the same papers can have surprisingly different results. So we hope you enjoy uh, this month's podcast and we look forward to any feedback that you have. Hi, this is Herb Kressel, editor of Radiology and welcome to this month's podcast. Today I'm joined by Dr. Rujang Lee, Assistant Professor of Radiation Oncology at Stanford University, and Dr. Daniel Rubin, Associate Professor of Radiology uh, at Stanford. Uh, and these two are among the authors in a very provocative study entitled Early Stage Non-Small Cell Lung Cancer, Quantitating Imaging, Quantitative Imaging Characteristics of FDG PET-CT to predict distant metastasis. Welcome, Dr. Lee. Hi. Hi, welcome, Dr. Rubin. Hello, thank you for joining us. Uh, Dr. Lee, let's begin with you. Uh, what was the rationale for this study? Why did you uh, and your colleagues undertake it? Well, I think the clinical motivation is that in the coming years, there will be increased uh, uh, prevalence of early stage lung cancer the success of uh, uh, screening programs. Um, so um, a key issue in managing these patients is that uh, while surgery or radiation therapy, especially the stereotactic radiotherapy, they can have excellent local control rates. But the, some fundamental issue is still that a significant portion of patients will have distant metastasis, and that's the main predominant cause of death in these patients. So our goal is to identify which of these patients will have high risk for distant metastasis so that we can potentially target them with uh, adjuvant therapy, which might uh, increase the survival. I see, so that would effectively uh, serve to make screening efforts of uh, greater value by uh, also treating those most likely to have distant metastasis. So can you tell us what you did in this study, Dr. Lee? Sure. So we looked at uh, the uh, FDG PET scans for these patients. For, radi for patients getting radiotherapy, we routinely get uh, FDG PET and CT for genome planning purposes. Um, so we retrospectively looked at uh, about 100 patients treated at our clinic, and these patients get, uh, they all got uniform uh, stereotype radiotherapy treatment. And then we look at, we used a quantitative radiomic approach uh, to extract a set of uh, quantitative features from FVG PET scans. And then we used 
uh, strategic approaches to uh, develop an image signature, uh, which or hopefully predict uh, distant metastasis. Thank you. Uh, uh, as I read the study, one question I had was actually was PET CT that was performed in all patients. So why not analyze the CT image features as well as the PET features? Uh, and moreover, uh, you know, motion uh, is more of an issue in terms of the PET data collection since it's sort of longer acquisitions. So this would, at first blush, appears to be sort of uh, less than optimal approach to the analysis. So why didn't you look at the CT? Dr. Rubin, you want to start? Sure. Uh, I'll start, and Dr. Uh, Lee can talk about the, the PET motion. Uh, so that's an excellent question. Certainly the, the PET data comes with the CT. Uh, one thing you don't generally have on board with uh, the CT on a PET CT is injection of intravenous contrast. And at our institution, a chest CT is done at much thinner slice thickness than uh, the PET CT. Um, certainly in CT characterization of lung nodules with quantitative methods, it's desirable to have very, very thin slices uh, for optimum spatial resolution. Uh, so it, however, uh, it is certainly possible and, and valid question to ask, well, we could certainly have tried to pull out quantitative features from the CT, and that most certainly would be worthwhile looking at as future work because operationally, if there's value in it, it would be nice if you just did it as part of one test as opposed to two separate uh, tests. Now, one of the reasons why there was focus on the PET as opposed to CT as the first uh, study to go for is the PET, of course, being based on a physiological uh, radiopharmaceutical offers the promise of quantitative physiological characterization, which is where we believe a lot of the signal in characterizing lung cancer lies. Also, there have been a number of papers already looking at quantitative features in CT, in the radiology journal, actually, uh, one paper from our group and, and others as well that have looked at that. So we wanted to focus for novelty on, on the PET. But um, to your point, I think it would definitely be worth looking at uh, the CT in future. Dr. Lee, any uh, more thoughts on sort of the issue of the motion effects on PET and how it may have affected uh, the data? Sure. Uh, actually, if you look at population level, um, there's, there's studies that uh, investigate the, mo the degree of lung tumor motion. Uh, so on average, you get about five millimeter motion uh, for, uh, for average patient. And one key difference from diagnostic scans uh, in these patients is that because they're getting radiotherapy, motion is a really, really important factor. It's something that we would, would like to limit. So in all patients getting uh, treatment simulation scans, including these PET scans, uh, we have uh, routine measures to limit the amount of motion, such as um, shallow breathing or abdominal compression, well, as other things that we took to uh, basically to limit the amount of motion during scans. So that something that, but something, it, it, the ideal if we have the uh, 4D or 80 scans, which uh, the motion, the, basically is motion free scans. But the issue with that is uh, your FDG pet and the PET scans, there's a reduced count if you, if you further being a different um, different data uh, data from different breathing phases. So um, there's a increased signal to noise ratio in regular scans. On the other hand, there's reduced uh, signal on uh, on the motion free scans. Got it. So uh, can you highlight your key findings? Because you you developed a uh, a quantitative uh, metric, a model. Uh, that uh, might be useful in predicting those patients who will uh, develop distant metastasis. Can you tell us the key findings of your study? Yes. So we extracted about 70 features. Uh, then we, we basically applied two, uh, two rules to further filter these, uh, these features. One is that these features, have, they had to be not redundant. Because usually, uh, if, you, if you're looking at a variety of features, uh, there can be correlation among them. So we first require them to be not redundant. And second, because there's 
uh, uncertainty, uh, intrinsic uncertainty regarding to the uh, delineation of tumor. So the second criterion replies that this feature has to be um, robust against variations in these different delineations. So with that, we have that will that left us with about half or thirty-five features uh, that we use to develop a statistical uh, model. Um, still, that's thirty-five is a relatively large number compared to the number of patients we have. So we then used a um, a lasso technique, which can help us to perform feature selection and at the same time to uh, optimize the model. So in the end, we end up with we end up with uh, two uh, image features. One of them is the peak SUV, which is well characterized in many studies. Uh, it's similar to SUV Max, but it uh, it uh, it's been shown to be more robust. And the other one is uh, um, is a class of texture features that describe the intratumoral heterogeneity of metabolic activity. I see. Now, these two features contribute together uh, to uh, decent metastasis risk. So uh, could you just briefly tell us what the lasso technique is? I, I read it in the paper. I'm not familiar with it. So lasso basically is, well, statistically speaking, it's a regularization technique. Uh, it's, you can intuitively you can think of, um, because you, you have a large number of features, Lasso technique will require you use a very small number of features to feed the data. I see. Without lasso, you 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 have all the features you have. But okay. with lasso, you 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 end up with only a few. It helps you narrow down. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Rubin, uh, our statisticians uh, very commonly, as a rule of thumb, suggest. Uh, 10 subjects per variable or features that are analyzed in this type of uh, study. And in this one, you did another technique on one of these leave one out analyses that, again, I think is aimed at dealing with the issue of uh, avoiding the problems of multiple comparisons. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, that approach and how does it relate to the lasso business? So the, the lasso part of the technique is the statistical model for making the predictions given the input covariates. The cross-validation technique is what do you do to train the model and test the model once you've established the model. So last the model that's established, as Dr. Lee explained, now what we need to do is there are three parameters that need to be fit. So to fit the, that, you're going to need to take a set of training cases and compare, you run them through the model and compare the model output with the ground truth that was known from those training cases and then adjust the weights iteratively until you get a good fit. Of course, you don't want to test the model you've just fit on exactly the same data that you trained with because you'll be subject to a phenomenon called overfitting and the result won't be reliable for testing on unseen data in the future. So what generally one does is a procedure called cross-validation. We used a variant called leave one out uh, where you hold out in the case of leave one out, one case. And you build the model on the remaining cases. And then once you fit the model, you test it on the held out case. So the held out case didn't uh, participate in training and therefore is valid for testing. And then you repeat that multiple times for each of the other cases. You generally pick a leave one out over holding out some larger number when the number of cases you have isn't substantial. Ideally, we would have, uh, your uh, the statistician's points are well taken, uh, and ideally you'd like to have as much data as possible. We are limited by the data available, and in the future would like ourselves to either acquire more cases or other investigators re preferably repeat our, our study and find out that they come up with similar results to make this most reliable. But at least with the data we tested with, leave one out, cross-validation is a valid procedure for evaluation. Great. Uh, now, this is, I thought, really exciting. It's sort of the direction that we really all want and need to move to get better quantitative parameters to help uh, mitigate undesired outcomes. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, what are actually the next steps uh, in the research you two are undertaking? Dr. Lee, uh, what is next steps in this line of research? 
Well, I think there are a few directions going forward. One of them, one of them is that uh, we like to um, explore the underlying mechanism of these imaging features. Sure. Because we make approach is really a uh, high throughput agnostic uh, approach without knowing what really uh, what it means. So I think next that we can potentially integrate imaging with uh, genomic data to uh, to see what uh, what molecular features correlate with the fan, with the imaging findings from this uh, from this study. Uh, of course, the other step is that really we need to validate. Uh, uh, these imaging imaging markers in large cohort, but uh, preferably in uh, multi-center uh, prospective studies. Got of course, the other ones, as that Dr. Rubin mentioned, uh, looking at CT features and see whether that complement uh, what we find. What we find is another direction. Right, Dr. Rubin. Any other thoughts on next steps in this line of research? Yes, I would, I would say one of the issues of uh, quantitative imaging in terms of uh, clinical acceptance to radiologists is uh, the black box problem of this, there's this model, I don't completely understand it, um, there are these features that go in that came from an image that I couldn't see the features that the model saw because they came from a computer. Can I believe it? It was done on one data set. At a minimum, we would like to have this model applied on a second independent data set um, you know, we did the cross-validation, that was still one data set. That data set isn't necessarily representative of the entire population of patients that exist. I mean, certainly regionally, but nationally or even internationally. So for there to be our believability on our part and others in terms of this model, we'd like to at least have someone else who's got retrospective data try it out and see if they get comparable results. Right. Now, uh, uh, we haven't talked about this before, but one of the things that comes up when we see these studies is the issue of integrating clinical parameters into these imaging-based models. Now, uh, I'm sort of at the limits of my understanding, but I, I, I have been led to believe that including biological variables uh, adds another level of complexity to the analysis and is not quite as straightforward as it might appear. Any thoughts about that, Dr. Rubin? Yes. Um, so the LASSO model is a multivariate model, and as you point out, there are different ways of approaching integration of other kinds of data. The simplest approach would be to simply expand the input covariates to the LASSO model. That will work pretty well with most clinical variables because those are discrete, small number of additional variables. The molecular data is a little more challenging. I mean, one approach could be to simply throw in all the gene expression, but there's <laughs> tens of thousands of genes, and, uh, and there's correlations between them. Now, the lasso, you know, as part of a shrinkage operation, throws out correlated variables, but in terms of uh, the input signal, the signal from biological data may be at a higher level than individual genes, maybe at the level of pathways or, or pathways working together. And so some kind of preprocessing or abstraction is generally needed to integrate molecular data in with the clinical and imaging data. And what many people do is they will do a technique called metagene generation or they will do uh, gene set enrichment analysis, these kinds of things to get abstraction from that very granular data up. But, it, and one can simply add that into a LASSO kind of model, but people could look at other models, and I'll, other than LASSO, um, such as maximum entropy, there's Bayesian-based models. Um, by and large, the, the models don't vary that much, but until we have multiple people comparing these different things, there are variables impact which we don't completely understand yet, and I'm, I'm hopeful that other people will be studying these problems with those kinds of methods. Right. Any final thoughts uh, on this line of research, Dr. Lee? Well, I think, yeah, the real motivation when we do this study is that we want to have optimal way to manage this uh, group of patients in early stage lung cancer. And we know that we can get very high local control rates with uh, radiotherapy, radio ther but still, uh, there's a small portion who are have decent metastasis. I think it, the optimal way is to combine all uh, multifactorial models because all these things uh, influence these outcomes. 
uh, clinical imaging or uh, genomic level, uh, I think really the goal, uh, the way forward is to uh, uh, to to discover new um, uh, new uh, biomarkers and validate them in a large uh, prospective cohorts. Very good. Well, I want to thank you both for a stimulating discussion on a pretty complex uh, uh, topic. Uh, it's been a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you for participating. Bye-bye. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is David Kalmus. I am the deputy editor for Neuroradiology. Today I am joined on this podcast by Ival Lotan, who is currently a fellow in neuroradiology at New York University and recently finished his residency training at Sheba Medical Center in Ramat Gan, Israel. We are here today to discuss his paper entitled, Diagnostic Value of Apparent Diffusion Coefficient for the Accurate Assessment in Differentiation of Postoperative Intracranial Abscesses. Dr. Lotan, welcome to the Radiology Podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to talk about this study. So our, our, uh, our listeners may have read your study, um, but just even so, could you briefly uh, tell us what you did in the study and what your major findings were? Sure. So in the study, we tried to assess the value of um, apparent diffusion coefficient, or ADC, for the diagnosis of postoperative intracranial abscess compared with spontaneous intracranial abscess. Um, we defined an abscess as postoperative or, uh, or spontaneous, uh, depending on whether or not uh, a primary neurosurgical uh, 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 procedure was performed. Uh, this was a retrospective study, and we included all the patient uh, that had clinical and imaging uh, data over a 10-year period from 2005 to 2015. Uh, so uh, for each patient, we uh, used a dedicated workstation and we marked three regions of interest uh, on the ADC map. Uh, including all the visible uh, area of the abscess. And uh, on, so, so on the upper, uh, middle, and lower plans, and that's why we calculate the ADC value. And we also evaluate the abscess uh, qualitatively for restricted diffusion and for the uh, homogeneity of the diffusion pattern. Um, so we had uh, 73 patients, uh, 30 patients with spontaneous abscess, and 43 patients with uh, postoperative abscess. And we found that on DWI, all the uh, spontaneous abscess had a, a restricted diffusion, and like almost all, like 80% of them had a, a homogeneous diffusion pattern. On the other, on the other hand, postoperative abscess, uh, only 60% of them had restricted diffusion, and only 30% had the uh, homogeneous diffusion pattern. When uh, regarding the ADC value, uh, the ADC, the median ADC values of uh, uh, postoperative access was 1.34. So it's almost double the median ADC value of uh, spontaneous abscess. And did, did these findings, the fact that postoperative abscesses do not, uh, are not uh, typical compared to um, the usual restricted diffusion uh, with abscesses, did that finding surprise you or were you expecting it? Well, Yes and no. Uh, we all know that um, uh, DWI is a very good uh, 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 method to, to for the diagnosis of spontaneous abscess. 
and we all use it all the time. But our clinical um, experience has suggested that uh, using DWI in the post-operative setting may be misleading. And maybe this is a good uh, uh, place to, to give credit to my mentor and co-author, Dr. Hen Hoffman. Um, we were surprised by the significant uh, difference between the values. Now, um, can you give any pathophysiological mechanism that might underlie the differences in how the postoperative versus spontaneous abscesses are behaving? Okay, a possible explanation um, for this difference may be depressed cellular immune responses uh, for postoperative uh, for patients with postoperative uh, abscesses uh, with lower inflammatory viable cell concentration, uh, maybe because of their underlying disease process or therapy. Uh, more explanation can be focal hemorrhage or post-operative fluid collection at the site of the infection, or the use of intraoperative uh, exogenous materials. Um, another explanation can be that the surgical intervention and also the underlying pathologic process uh, can disrupt the normal anatomy and can lead to a dead space with compromised vascular supply, so that result in lower cellular and protein concentration at the site of the infection. Are yeah, those, are all, those are all interesting uh, postulates. Do you have any empiric data from drainages of the abscesses that might point you one way or the other in terms of cellularity, protein content, concentration, hemorrhage, et cetera? So we still don't, we don't have it because it was a retrospective uh, study. We don't have it, unfortunately. Uh, we, know, we know that um, uh, the relationship between histology and um, restricted diffusion in brain abscess is, is uh, complex and unclear. It's unknown. So it is assumed to be due to combination of inflammatory viable cells, uh, necrotic debris, uh, viscosity, and macromolecular concentration of macromolecules in, in uh, like protein in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we hope that uh, better understanding of this uh, relationship, uh, uh, we will have it very soon. So this, um, this is a very uh, uh, interesting study, and it certainly is provocative. And I think it gets our attention that we shouldn't assume that any uh, collection that's infected uh, within the cranium uh, should have restricted diffusion. Uh, but you didn't look at a group of patients who were post-operative that had sterile collections. And so how can you apply these data in patients who have had a cranial procedure and present with suspected infection in the setting of a fluid collection? Can, we, can you extend your data to give a differential diagnosis there, or is that the domain of a future study? To clarify, to clarify, you've shown nicely that it's not at all unusual for post-operative infections um, to have a, a restriction of diffusion that's unlike spontaneous abscesses. Yeah. However, the clinical question is going to be a patient comes in having had surgery with a collection. You want to know not whether it's spontaneous or post-operative because you know it's post-operative. You want to know is that post-operative collection infected or not? Does your study help, or, or are future studies required to answer that question? Yes, uh, f thank you. So future, yeah, our, our study didn't, uh, didn't study this question because what we want to say that, what I already said, that also DWI is an excellent tool for access in the, that without surgery, when we know that there was surgery, uh, 
DWI is not sufficient and shouldn't be used as the key modality in this uh, situation. And clinical judgment and clinical suspicion may stay, it needs to be very, to stay very, remain very important. Right, I, I agree. I was asking a leading question, but it seems to me if a patient comes with a, with a, a post-operative post -operative collection that doesn't have restricted diffusion, you should not exclude the diagnosis of infection. Of and course. you should pursue it. So I think that is an important teaching point. We don't know the denominator and how many of those patients who are post-operative with an unrestricted uh, diffusion collection are infected versus not, but we know that at least some of them are. Yes. Almost, as I said, almost 40% of the patients without a restricted diffusion in our study actually had proven a, a, a uh, proven diagnosis of abscess. So yes. Yeah. No, I think it's it's a very important question, and it's a very clinically relevant answer you gave us. Um, and uh, um, we uh, we think it'll be immediately applicable in the clinic. Um, well, I thank you for joining us. Before we finish, is there anything that we didn't cover um, that you'd want the listeners to hear about? Uh, I think we we talked about the main uh, issues of the study. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, thank you for your support of radiology, and we look forward to, forward to future excellent studies from your group. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you very much. Hi, this is Herb Kressel, editor of Radiology, and welcome uh, to this month's podcast. Today, I'm joined by uh, Dr. Matt McGinnis, who is Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Ottawa, uh, and uh, who, with his co-authors, has uh, uh, authored a, uh, a very stimulating study looking at the diagnostic accuracy meta-analyses that are published in imaging journals and analyzing the pooling techniques and their impact on summary estimates of diagnostic accuracy. We're seeing more and more studies of this sort, and uh, the work of Dr. McGinnis and colleagues, I think, is very helpful in sort of peeling back the onion a bit uh, to better understand the drivers of the estimates of diagnostic accuracy in these types of studies. Welcome, Dr. McGinnis. Thank you, Dr. Kressel. So let's get started. Uh, what's the rationale for studying meta-analyses? Uh, aren't these at the top of the evidence-based medicine pyramid? They're already at the top of the chain, uh, food chain. What do we need to study these for? Well, I think uh, meta-analyses, like any other research, can be done well or they can be done not so well. And certainly when a meta-analysis is done well and it's based on high-quality evidence, it can't be um, at the top of the research food chain pyramid or, or certainly near it. But when it's done in ways that um, are suboptimal, it might not be reflective of true results and may be more misleading than anything because people may put uh, a false sense of uh, authority or, or um, put it up at the top of the hierarchy when it's not necessarily appropriate. I see. Now, uh, in your study, your, you, your focus was on imaging journals. Are these different than uh, imaging studies, rather? Are these types of studies different in any way? Do they present some particular challenges in meta-analysis? Why did you choose to study these uh, uh, meta-analyses? Well, the short answer is I studied imaging journals because I'm a radiologist, so it's of interest to me. But the particular challenge of imaging is that we're often interested in test accuracy, uh, so measures of sensitivity and specificity. Now, when you do pooling and meta-analysis, or you combine the results from multiple studies, typically you use what's called a univariate random effects model, which will just pool the results uh, on their own, not considering anything else. If you do this with sensitivity and specificity, it ignores the correlation between those two factors, and it can potentially lead to misleading results. So we need special tests when we're dealing with diagnostic accuracy measures called uh, bivariate models or hierarchical models, uh, and if you don't use those, it can potentially lead to misleading results. So imaging in and of itself is of interest to me, and there are some unique features that we have to consider in imaging studies. So my understanding is that uh, 
the recommendation to use these bivariate or hierarchical types of analyses uh, are relatively recent. Uh, when, when were these introduced and, and was this in specific for imaging studies or for a range of studies? So these were not specific for imaging studies, it's for any diagnostic test accuracy study, whether it's a lab test, physical examination, Im imaging test, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, types of diagnostic test accuracy that tests that you can do, but imaging is certainly a large component of those. The hierarchical model by Rutter and Getsonis was introduced in 2001, and the bivariate model by Rietzma and his group was introduced in 2005. Like with any research, that can often take a long time to disseminate, uh, and certainly the number of meta-analyses being done in imaging has really been exploding of late, but the knowledge on how to do them has taken a while to disseminate. So the Cochrane uh, Diagnostic Test Accuracy Methods Group recommends that we use these models. That recommendation uh, started in about 2009, um, but it's taken a while to get out there because as imaging researchers, we may not be aware of that recommendation. So part of this study is to raise awareness of proper methods for pooling. I see. Now, uh, what did you do exactly in your study? Can you tell us about your study design and methods? Sure. So we wanted to evaluate whether meta-analyses done in imaging journals were using appropriate hierarchical pooling techniques when they're looking at diagnostic accuracy measures. So we looked at about 300 meta-analyses published over a 10-year period from 2005 to 2015 in imaging journals, and that's loosely categorized and defined by Thompson and Reuters. Uh, so we just use that group of journals. Um, so of these 300, we looked to see whether the authors used bivariate or hierarchical methods, or they used traditional univariate methods, which wouldn't generally be recommended for diagnostic test accuracy meta-analysis. What we found was <clears throat> that a minority of journals were using the appropriate bivariate or hierarchical methods, so uh, less than 40% were using them. And then what we did is we took the ones that, the, the studies that used a univariate method or the, the method that's not recommended, and we reanalyzed their, their results using the appropriate method using a program called R. Um, when we reanalyzed the results, we looked to see whether there were differences in the sensitivity, specificity, or the confidence intervals derived from one method versus the other. And we did find that there were differences. So the differences we found were that the traditional or the univariate models that are not recommended tend to overestimate diagnostic accuracy with more narrow confidence intervals. The overestimation is not huge. It's about 2% for sensitivity and specificity. And the confidence intervals are about 7% uh, more narrow uh, than the proper bivariate model would derive. Now, some people might say 2% isn't a lot, but uh, a proportion of the studies had large deviations. So deviations of 5 to 10% in the summary estimates were seen in uh, seven of the 50 uh, studies we, we looked at uh, for sensitivity and 11 of the 50 studies for specificity. So these are some pretty huge deviations we're seeing in a, about 20% of the studies. So there's potential for a lot of misleading data to be put out there. What about the, uh, the mean 7.7% change in the width of the confidence interval? Do you think that's kind of clinically significant in general? I think so. I mean, it has to do with how certain a radiologist would be in um, the range of their results when applying a test. And it might have importance in, um, let's say, guidelines organizations or uh, governmental organizations that might recommend a test on a population basis. And they might use the confidence intervals to estimate in models on, on how the test might perform. And if those confidence intervals are too narrow, they might come up with some misleading uh, data and the results might not be reflective of, of truth. So I think at that, that broader scale, when meta-analyses are often used to pump data into cost-effectiveness models at the population level, those more narrow confidence intervals uh, might have a huge impact. I see. And uh, you, you looked at a number of different imaging journals. Were there any important differences in the use of the hierarchical approach in the different imaging journals? 
There were. So we looked at journals uh, that had published more than 10 meta-analyses within our sample, and there's quite a bit of variability between the journals. Journals like radiology and European radiology um, that are sort of more aware and promoting these models had good but not great uptake uh, with about 50 to 75% of their studies using the bivariate models. Uh, and some other journals where the awareness isn't as high um, had lower estimates. So quite a lot of journal level variability, which certainly speaks to the fact that the awareness of these proper methods um, is not disseminated uniformly. And authors, reviewers, editors uh, really need to be aware of these techniques and what the optimal techniques are in order to ensure that we're publishing good data. And uh, mea culpa, the, the first meta-analysis I published in radiology actually didn't use a bivariate model. And this was around the time where, um, you know, Cochrane was figuring out what was the optimal model. And I discussed it with a statistician and he said, oh, no, we don't need a bivariate model. So, so I'm one of the uh, offending authors. So, so part, of, part of this study was derived from my own experience. Well, in all fairness, the uh, recommendations... Uh, were later than the start date of your study accrual. So correct, correct. 2009, but you were accruing from 2005. What about the uh, meta-analyses in uh, different areas of imaging? Were there important differences and different subspecialties? Um, there were. Again, there was quite a lot of variability between these subspecialties. Um, it, it's hard to know uh, what what these differences mean, but gastrointestinal and obstetrical uh, subspecialties had better use or, or higher levels of use. That may be driven by uh, a few centers and a few authors in areas like the Netherlands where um, these techniques were developed and disseminated. So it may be just um, more of a geographic or institutional effect where these people, are, a few researchers are doing a lot of work in these areas and therefore representing a lot of work in those subspecialties. But again, I think the variability speaks for opportunities for more wide, broad dissemination of what the appropriate methods are. So for uh, many of our uh, viewers and listeners, this uh, uh, talk may seem somewhat esoteric. Uh, you know, we're in the weeds of this stuff. But what do you think are the important take-home message of your study for readers of these types of papers? I think readers need to be aware that there are specific techniques needed for pooling of data and diagnostic test accuracy studies. And if they don't see the words bivariate or hierarchical models uh, in the description of the results, uh, they should be circumspect about whether appropriate techniques have been used. Um, we hope that with this study and others, the awareness is uh, raised and that we'll see less and less of the univariate studies being used. However, there's a freeware program out there called MetaDisc, uh, which uh, advertises itself as appropriate for DTA uh, meta-analysis, and unfortunately it doesn't use the appropriate techniques. Um, so this is one of the, um, you know, we're swimming against the tide. It's actually a very nice program. It's well written and it works really well. And until recently, authors haven't had a, an easy program to use uh, other than that, so fortunately R now has a software package you can use and it's freely available, but we're swimming against the tide a bit because a lot of authors just Google DTA net analysis, find this program and it's there. So in short, I think if authors are aware we need um, bivariate methods uh, and they see that, they can be assured that at least the pooling has been done in a manner that's appropriate. Very good. Well, uh, Dr. McGinnis, uh, I want to thank you very much for this paper and for bringing this important issue to the fore, and it's been a pleasure talking with you. You're welcome. Have a great day, Dr. Kressel. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.